Welcome back everyone to our lessons in jurisprudence. In this video what we're going to do is move away from some of the classical theories of legal positivism where we were drawing on the works and the philosophy of John Austin and moving more towards the concept of the modern legal positivist, drawing more on the works of philosophers such as HLA Hart. This is going to be more important for most of you who are studying uh, legal positivism, given the fact that the more modern interpretations of legal positivism are seen to have a little bit more legitimacy than those of the classical theories. The reason for this is, of course, because as time goes on, people develop more and more, uh, more and more sophisticated theories of law. And so a result of this is that you begin to develop ones which are uh, less difficult to scrutinize. But that's not to suggest that the modern legal positivism of HLA Hart is not um, a void of any kind of criticism. We'll get to criticisms in the future. It's just that the criticisms that are part of the Hart uh, types of positivism aren't as substantive, at least in my opinion, as that of Austin's rejection of international law, for example which is, of course, a very uh, for anyone who is uh, an international lawyer, is a, a very significant um, issue when it comes to uh, when it when it comes to a, a critique of John Austin. So what Austin, uh, sorry, what Hart does is take the works of John Austin and looks to uh, maintain some of the core elements of legal positivism that develop out of Austin's theory but begins to then supplement and build upon some of the more controversial elements and tries to develop a more sophisticated set of legal principles. Hart's theories of legal positivism are arguably some of the most influential theories of law, not just within the, the, the school of positivism, but within jurisprudence more, more generally, one of the most important theories of jurisprudence that you will ever study. And the sort of heart walking debate that we will get to in future lessons time will be one of the most groundbreaking parts of philosophy when it comes to legal philosophy specifically. So let's just think and take a brief recap at what we are talking about when we think about legal positivism and what it means to be a positivist. Because since Hart is a legal positivist, he will maintain one of the most core and fundamental elements of positivism that is established by the likes of John Austin, this being something known as the separability thesis. The separability thesis is something that is maintained through the classical into the modern positivist theories. What this essentially tells us is really one of the core definitions of positivism more generally, i.e. that there are many different external factors um, which transcend uh, which transcend and, ha and are transcendent but have no uh, relation to the law. Okay, um, So any of the external factors that we can think of when we think about how law may regulate certain things um, are, are not related to law. So colloquially, we might suggest that law is related to morality in the way that it sort of rela uh, regulates morality or is derived from moral principles. But according to the positivist, this isn't true. There are no transcendental ideas which relate to law. They remain separate, hence the name separability thesis. They exist separately from these virtues. And this means that law is a closed loop, if you will. It determines the conditions of its own existence, and so as a result of which, it does not require any external factors to determine its existence other than the law itself. The law is determined by itself. The law isn't determined by morality or justice or fairness or equity. Any of these different, what would be sort of, uh, in quotation marks, uh, transcendental in these ideas. Now, one of the things that is important to note when we think about legal positivism and we think about the concept of morality in relation to legal positivism is that just because law, according to a positivist of a classical or even a modern um, perspective, does not believe that, uh, or at least law, is not something that is requ requires anything else other than its own existence to uh, be justified and be legitimate, that does not suggest that morality has no relevance at all when it comes to law, that there is no moral value in discussing law in that kind of way as part of ethical systems. The positivist does not completely and entirely detach 
morality from the law. It just suggests that the concept of where law comes from and how law is legitimized and justified does not require any kind of reference to morality, unlike things like natural law, for example. Uh, for the most part, most legal positivists can and will accept that some laws have moral content, that there is sort of moral uh, content that exists in certain laws, or even that even if one is not influenced by the other or one does not require the existence of the other, they can at least still effectively say the same thing. So, for example, criminalizing murder is something that we would suggest as a positivist has no moral content. The law is the law and it is justified on the basis of the fact that the law is what it is. Uh, but can still align with morality law can still align and, and essentially broadly follow what the what the moral uh, what morality tells us um, it's just that it does not require morality for its existence and so if there is an immoral law that can still be considered law uh, that's what we're essentially asking when we talk about the distinctions between positivists and natural lawyers and and even critical theorists we're talking about the ontology of law we're talking about what a thing is and how a thing can be determined to be law uh, and whether or not a certain law is or is not a law when you talk about natural law theorists they argue that if a law is immoral or if a law is in contravention to the natural law then it is not law but the positivist says that this is not true but this positivist does not therefore also suggest that uh, there is no moral content or that we can't uh, discuss law in the same way as we in the same breath as morality for example so that's what we are talking about. Not that they do not have moral content, but just that the moral content is not necessary to the existence of the legal norm. It is not a necessity, a necessary condition for this particular legal principle to exist. Now, debates about the moral content of legal norms are essentially debates about things that ha happen and that occur after you have determined the nature of legality. Remember, we're taking one step back at the moment. Jurisprudence at this point is talking about whether or not a thing is or isn't a law and what we suggest makes something a law. What is? How do we justify the existence of law, the ontology of law? Now, the debates about the moral content of legal norms are debates that take place sort of afterwards, after you come to the conclusion about what things are and what things are not law. And this really brings us to Hart's jurisprudence in a little bit more detail, because according to Hart, an evil law could still be a law, which is something which is, of course, in contravention to the natural law scholars who suggest that what makes a thing a law is in deference to the moral law that exists, the, the morality that, that is established, depending on where we are thinking in, in terms of um, either classical theorists of natural law, so people like Augustine and Aquinas, they take a very theological Catholic, uh, Catholic view of the natural law. If you talk about more modern theories like Phyllis and Fuller, who take more of a natural rights perspective, perspective or, 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 or theories of natural rights, then, then there is a little bit of a distinction there. But fundamentally, at its heart, natural law requires a reference to morality for law to be justified. According to Hart and according to Austin Pryor, an evil law can still be a law. And this is set out very clearly when we have and we talk about the debates that were had um, between Hart and Fuller um, when it comes to laws passed by the Nazis and, and the Third Reich, which were anybody, including Hart, would conclude are immoral and evil. But natural lawyers would say that because they are immoral and evil, because things like the 1935 Nuremberg laws were immoral and evil, that means that they were not laws. It is not a legal system per se, according to a natural law scholar. But according to Hart, uh, he would say that, well, no, an evil law can still be a law. It is not its reference to morality that determines its own existence. This does not exclude critique of the law, but just that uh, any critique will be a moral, uh, philosophical or political in nature, okay? Not a legal critique. It won't be a question of whether or not something is or isn't a law. The positivist's perspective on what is and what isn't a law is relatively simple because it is referenced, if you're talking about Austin, to the sovereign. It is referenced to its own existence that determines whether or not it is, uh, is or is not a law. Over the last few lessons, we've been talking about the various different approaches within legal positivism as part of a jurisprudential theory of law. 
we talked about classical legal positivism, talking about the likes of people like John Austin and, and the interpretations of legal positivism from that perspective. We then talked about more modern theories of legal positivism, introducing the writings and the philosophy of H.L.A. Hart, a legal positivist who was writing uh, post the Second World War in relation to um, in relation to legal positivism. This lesson is going to dive into the details of positivism as presented by the likes of people like Hart. Uh, we're essentially going to be talking about some of the key components of Hart's legal positivism because these are going to crop up in a bit more detail in the next lesson when we look at the responses to the likes of people like HLA Hart uh, by writers such as Ronald Dworkin um, who would respond to these and critique legal positivism from his perspective. So essentially the legal positivism that is conceptualized by Hart is a conception of law as based uh, on basic rules okay so remember we're thinking beginnings to thinking we're beginning to think about some of the ontological questions of law we're talking about the approaches to law and the questions of what something is or is not in relation to law i.e whether or not something is or is not a law and why and on what basis this is determined. For a natural law scholar, this can be referenced to the moral law, the morality that is ascribed either, namely through Christian theology, if we're thinking about classical natural law, or even theories of natural rights, if we're thinking about the people such as Finnis and Fuller. When we talk about legal positivists, they detached they detach morality from the conception of law that is ascribed as to essentially um, suggest that you can have a law which does not adhere to basic moral principles, but it would still be law. And Hart is no different in his conception of legal positivism. And he develops a conception of law that is based on a series of rules. He will divide these rules, in inverted commas, into two major categories. Hart describes on the one hand the existence of primary rules, and then on the other hand the existence of secondary rules. All very simple at the moment. Now, within Hart's conception of legal positivism, primary rules are the rules that instruct people in society instruct us as members of society about what we may or may not be able to do so as essentially a primary rule instructs one to uh, to understand how best to act in a particular circumstance in a particular circumstance what are the rules in terms of how we can and cannot act these are the regulations of law which are for the proper running of society essentially so things like road traffic laws all of which would fall into the category of the primary rules they instruct you on how you can and cannot act when you are on the road for example the speed limit that you go whether or not you should stop at a red light whether or not you should give way or you should indicate when you get off a roundabout etc 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 all of which are road traffic laws uh, whether or not you can drink and drive also is a primary rule i.e. you can't <laughs> is the answer to that question and it is in telling us and instructing us about what we can and cannot do Without these primary rules, these rules of regulation that are established by Hart, it is argued that society cannot run in a proper and functioning way. So road traffic, without road traffic law, for example, we wouldn't have a very uh, properly functioning society in relation to uh, the way in which we regulate our roads. We would have essentially um, motor anarchy, if you will. There are also rules about paying taxes on time. These also include um, and are for part of the category of primary rules that is established by Hart. So essentially what we describe as a primary rule um, is what Hart would argue is a rule that if we didn't follow, the structure of society would collapse. So, for example, if no one paid their taxes, then there would be no way to pay for the roads that we have road traffic laws for, or hospitals, or the police, or fire, or education, and essentially society would collapse. So these are considered to be uh, primary rules. If we didn't have road traffic laws, then everybody would go through red lights, they could go at whatever speed they like, uh, they could um, drink and drive, they could drink under the, uh, drive under the influence, You'd have lots of crashes, you would have anarchy on the roads, as I've mentioned, and you would end up with a collapse of the basic structure of society. 
all of which suggest therefore that primary rules are required for the proper running and the proper functioning of our society. On the other hand, secondary rules are a little bit more complicated and they are actually further subdivided into other categories. Uh, ultimately, these are divided into rules of change, rules of adjudication and rules of recognition. These are the major categories or subcategories, should I say, of the secondary rules within society. A rule of change is what Hart uses to argue um, that essentially any society has to have um, in order uh, for something to be called law. So what Hart argues when it comes to rules of change is that the existence of something called law must have a way to change the law. So the idea of law according to Hart is not something that is static. Law is not something that you create and then you could never ever ever change. The purpose of law in any society is for its ability to change in some kind of way. And so the primary rules will need secondary rules for you to tell them how for you to know should i say for them to tell you how to change them essentially so one of the examples of how we can apply this in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives in terms of the english legal system is the fact that parliament can pass statute and those statutes can change the pre-existing legal principles that exists let's say there is some uh, there are some uh, new, uh, a new thing that takes place, a new a traffic accident that takes place that requires a further a, a adaptation and change to road traffic law to essentially sell, uh, to regulate and, and to make those roads safer. Or Parliament could pass a law or pass a statute or pass an amendment to a particular piece of statute to essentially change the pre-existing <coughs> legal principles that existed and make changes to the primary rules. The second principle is the rule of adjudication. And what the rule of adjudication suggests is that for a legal system to be considered a legal system according to a heart positivist perspective, there must be some way for disputes about primary rules to be settled. So it is not enough to just have primary rules that exist and for us to all just follow primary rules because there will always be situations where the primary rules uh, give rise to disputes, where one side of an argument decides that they are in the right and the other side actually argue that they're in the right and the primary rule may be quite vague on how to actually apply that principle to the day-to-day -day facts of that particular case and so with the existence of a legal uh, a legal judicial system you satisfy the rules of adjudication because what a, a judicial system essentially allows us to do is to adjudicate over the primary rules if there is a case where an individual has uh, uh, if we continue with the case of road traffic law an individual has been accused of uh, driving under the influence okay now this is a criminal offense and so it is up to the rules of adjudication i.e the judicial system more specifically the criminal justice system um, to essentially adjudicate on the settlement of that particular primary rule on whether or not that individual is in contravention of the primary rule that has been established Finally, then you have what are known as rules of recognition. These are arguably the most problematic of the three secondary rules that we established. Um, there is only essentially one rule of recognition. And what Hart suggests is that the rule of recognition is derived from internal knowledge rather than from our external empirical understanding of the world. So what we suggest here is that they are a priori uh, in terms of the ability for us to recognize rules of recognition. And what a rule of recognition is and what it means is that people who are internal to the existing legal system must recognize a rule, a primary rule, as law. So if you are part of an internal uh, legal system, a part of an internal society, you must be able to uh, satisfy the rule of recognition. You must be able to recognize that a primary rule is law. And so as a result of which it is a piece of uh, legislation or it is a, a principle or a rule that one must be able to follow. Finally, then, let's just talk about the distinctions that can exist between Austin's positivism and Hart's positivism. They are they are very different in a number of different ways. Um, they are both positivist in nature because they both share some of the most fundamental elements of legal positivism. Uh, but one of the key distinctions that it can be made between Hart and Austin is that Hart does not rely on the concept of a sovereign uh, 
to essentially legitimize the basic principles of law. This is very useful because it allows for us to understand and to have a conception of legal positivism, which also allows for us to have a conception of international law as being part of that broader conversation in jurisprudence. One of the things that makes people quite uncomfortable about uh, Austinian positivism is the fact that what is seemingly a legal system in and of itself, public international law, uh, does not seem to have the same kind of recognition of law or as law uh, that the domestic systems will have. Now, that's still a position that a lot of people still hold, uh, specifically domestic lawyers in, um, in academic circles. But for the most part, you would recognize that even though international law is different in a number of ways to domestic legal systems, it is still nevertheless considered law. So how does Austin get around this? Well, it's very difficult for him to do so. He simply just denies the existence of international law, or at least he accepts maybe the existence of international law, the basic principles, but he does not recognize that those things are law. Art, on the other hand, can. And so as a basis of not relying on sovereignty as being the fundamental cornerstone for the legitimacy of law, what Hart is able to do is allow for the existence of international law. It does not broadly deal with the complexities of sovereignty and questions of uh, as to where sovereignty is to be located. This is another conception of Austinian positivism that's quite difficult to derive. Um, it's all well and good saying that law is derived and leg legitimized on the basis of sovereignty, but where does sovereignty come from and whereabouts can we locate sovereignty in a specific legal system? That's a little bit more complicated. Again, something that is not relied upon by the works and writings of HLA Hart. So in the previous lesson, we discussed some of the jurisprudential theories which were associated closely with that of HLA Hart. We talked about some of the general rules and implications of Hart's jurisprudence, which is a more modern, up-to-date version of legal positivism, where Hart essentially makes a delineation between what he describes as primary rules, which are the rules of law which essentially are required for the operationalization of society, and then the various different secondary rules which relate to those primary rules. This lesson is going to talk about the critiques that have been levied against H.L.A. Hart by the philosopher Ronald Dworkin. We'll talk about Dworkin in terms of his career as a philosopher, as a, as a jurisprudential theorist, and then we'll start to talk about the application of Dworkin's jurisprudence to that of essentially critiquing some of the more modern theories and modern forms of legal positivism. So this is essentially Dworkin's critique of legal positivism, and really we are talking mainly about the debates that were had between Hart and Dworkin around the philosophy of law and essentially jurisprudential ideas. So like I said, beginning first then, we'll talk about essentially the career of Ronald Dworkin as a, as a philosopher, as a legal philosopher, and as a jurisprudential theorist. He was a legal theorist who lived between uh, 1931 and 2013. He was a professor of law and philosophy at uh, at NYU and then also at UCL University. Uh, so these are two relatively prestigious universities in the United States. And he was also the chair of jurisprudence at the University of Oxford, which is, of course, a very prestigious position within the University of Oxford. His philosophical influence can really be situated in the times in which he was doing his philosophy. So people like Hart were writing at the time that Dworkin was writing. But then if you look at philosophers from other different uh, uh, philosophical disciplines, people like Quine, um, they were also quite influential. Of course, Quine was more influential in terms of his development of modal logic, his development of metaphysics, and also his development on the philosophy of language, all of which we have lessons on in and over on the Philosophy Academy YouTube channel where we're actually at the moment, at the time of recording at least, um, uh, talking about and discussing Quine's theories of ontological commitments. So we describe a lot of the work pertaining to Dworkin as something of a response to the legal positivism of H.L.A. Hart, because essentially you can't really detach the two from each other, because Dworkin's development of his own theories of, of law and jurisprudence were that of a response to people like H.L.A. Hart. 
And so the back and forth debate that was had between these two uh, philosophers, uh, which was in some cases actually a debate that was back and forth, um, were uh, were essentially allowing for us to intertwine these two philosophers, such that such that you can't really talk about Hart without really referencing Dworkin, and you can't reference Dworkin without talking about Hart. So with that being said then, if you haven't seen our video on legal positivism from uh, the perspective of HLA Hart and the modern forms of positivism, um, then I would highly recommend you go and look at that first. Um, it will be in order in the, uh, in the playlist. But let's just do a recap of Hart's legal positivism. So what Hart does is describe law as a set of rules, okay, and we remember that this is something where we see a detachment from morality, which is of course how Hart delineates himself as a positivist away from the, the natural law theories that were beginning to wane in terms of their popularity. According to Hart's concept of law, he says that the rule of recognition providing the criteria by which the val validity of other rules of the system are, is assessed as an ultimate rule, and where there are several criteria ranked in order, or relative subordination and primacy of one of them is supreme. This is his explanation of what he describes as the rule of recognition, which is described and defined as one of the major secondary rules of Hart's jurisprudence. If you remember, we're talking about uh, rules of adjudication, for example, rules of change, i.e. I, in order for a primary rule to be a law, uh, it ought to have the ability to change and be reformed to better reflect societal standards. Adjudication refers to the idea that law, in order for it to uh, a rule for it, uh, in order for a rule, sorry, to be law, it should have the ability to, or there should be some mechanism by which an individual can actually go about and adjudicate on the disputes arising out of those law, uh, those laws. And then you also have this idea that is re recognised in this passage here, which is of course the rule of recognition. So what Dworkin does is he begins by critiquing the positivist conception that law contains rules and that law could be represented as a set of rules. And because of the, the reason for this is because, according to Dworkin, law can also contain non-rule standards. So to suggest that law is just a collection of rules and law is best to be perceived as rules is something that Dworkin critiques, and he uh, essentially issues a counterexample to this particular conception, arguing that, okay, well, if that's the case, then why does law contain non-rule standards? Uh, so therefore, as a result of which, you would conclude that Hart's legal positivism is, um, is, is incomplete, or it, it is lacking in some way. What Dworkin does then in building his conception is that Firstly, recognising that law contains non-rule standards, first of all, but then suggesting that these non-rule standards could be considered to be principles. So the existence of these principles are not necessarily to, not necessarily to advance some kind of socio-political or economic end goal. Remember, the word telos is just a translation of uh, ancient Greek for the, for the word end. When we talk about something having a teleology or having a telos, we're talking about the end goal. So when we think about a, uh, the Aristotelian influences on natural law that we did earlier on in this series of lessons, we talked about the fact that uh, Aristotle was very teleological in his perspectives of law, or at least his perspectives of rules, and actually his perspective of morality more generally. And so the existence of principles when it comes to Dworkin's conception is not to advance some kind of end goal, some kind of socio-political end, uh, but rather to fulfil some requirement of justice or fairness, i.e. or some other dimension of morality. So really, in this sense, the, the, the telos of a particular legal principle is not relevant in terms of what Dworkin would describe as these principles. Rather, the, the point of it is the idea and the requirement of justice or fairness itself. What happens here is that uh, Dworkin will discuss a number of cases which illustrate this point. Uh, and one of the very, very key cases that is very interesting in this regard, that, that illustrates this point perfectly, is the case from 1889 of Riggs and Palmer. Ultimately, 
the defendant in this case uh, murdered the testator of an estate. Remember, uh, or for anybody who has not studied the law of trusts, a testator is uh, the person is a person who will transfer legal title in the creation of a trust. A testator is um, dead, and the settler would be somebody who is alive who does uh, who creates a trust. So. The settler and the testator are the same person, but it, we define them as a settler or a testator depending on whether or not they're dead or alive. Now, the interesting thing here was that the estate was due to be inherited by the murderer upon the death of the testator. So they, the testator had an estate and um, uh, essentially the person who was going to inherit said estate uh, was um, the murderer of this particular um, particular uh, particular uh, uh, individual or at least uh, or at least m more specifically um, the law at the time meant that according to the law of succession at the time uh, the the murderer would actually have inherited the estate of the um, of the murdered person okay so they may not have been directly um, in the estate at the time of the murder but they would have inherited the, the estate upon the death of the testator um, and so the law of succession meant that essentially what we have here um, is an individual who is a murderer who is now inheriting the state of the victim. And of course, this is not doesn't sit particularly well in a number of different instances. The courts held in this case that no one shall be permitted to profit by his own fraud or to acquire property of his own crime. So what this is essentially suggesting is that even though upon an ordinary understanding and reading of the law of succession in this case the person who was the murderer should have inherited the uh, should have inherited the estate because of the fact that an individual should not have profited from their own fraud or have acquired property by their own crime it meant that they were not going to get the estate in question so this is an example that Dworkin uses to illustrate the fact that there are some principles that don't necessarily uh, ad adhere to uh, a rule uh, and therefore a law as a rule, as, as Hart would have suggested, but rather um, fits certain circumstances to deliver justice or fairness in individual cases. So like... Uh, like uh, uh, like Dworkin says here, he talks about the idea of there being um, a principle that will um, serve or fulfill the requirement of some other dimension of morality. And he uses this example here of the case of Riggs and Palmer to illustrate this point, essentially. Dworkin then argues that this is how a principle operates, essentially. He says that a principle should be able to override an established rule that is a legal rule. Because if we go back to this case of Riggs and Palmer, the established legal rule of the law of succession was that the murderer would have actually inherited the estate of the victim and so therefore would have killed the person and would have gotten all this person's money and been very, very happy probably. And so as a result of this, that is the rule, but the courts overruled that rule essentially. They said that um, this would override the established rule and that's what Dworkin argues is a principle. The difference, between, the difference between legal rules and legal principles is actually one, according to Dawkins, of a logical distinction. They can both um, point to particular decisions about legal obligations, but what they will do is differ in their character. So legal principles, as we've mentioned, aim to achieve justice or fairness or other moral uh, dimensions um, uh, without consideration necessarily for the teleological perspective of society, the teleological end goal, whether that be socio-economic or political. Continuing then and, and going back to Hart's uh, principles of, uh, of jurisprudence, um, we have to think about uh, the concept of of the rule of recognition, which is one that Hart develops, but also one that Dworkin will reject. He rejects the notion that there exists some kind of mass rule for, for, in every legal system that is utilized to identify the validity of law, which is what the rule of recognition is. And if you want to know more, go back to the previous lesson. And the reason why he comes to this conclusion uh, is because the idea of a rule of recognition would actually lead to a situation where we actually pr uh, develop a process of identifying law, um, but we have to think about this in a, a, as something which would be of relative ease. And so he rejects this view. He rejects the, the idea of uh, that the rule of recognition entailing that the process of identifying law must be an easy process. 
Actually, Dworkin argues that people still have legal rights, even in cases where the correct legal outcome is disputed. So whereas Hart would suggest that according to the rule of recognition, we should be able to identify law within a, a particular situation with relative ease. And bear in mind, that is not just recognizing that a thing is law, that, a, that for example, if parliament passes um, legislation, that that is law, but talking about legal judgments in, in adjudicative cases. So even where the correct legal outcome is disputed in those situations, some of the really complicated and difficult and often heavily critiqued situations, Dworkin suggests that, uh, I mean, if we were to if we were able to uh, follow the, the rule of recognition by heart, then this would be a difficult thing to reconcile. But according to Dworkin, those people still have legal rights. The law exists somewhere in this particular set of circumstances. And this is the case even where the correct legal outcome is disputed. Finally, then, I just want to talk a little bit about the interrelationship between law and morality, something that we have uh, really been coming back to as a major theme throughout this series of lessons, specifically looking at when we talk about uh, positivism. Well, this is one of the areas where Dworkin actually agrees to an extent with the writings of H.L.A. Hart. He um, argues uh, against the view um, that law and morality are to be completely separate. OK, and what he does is cite a constructive interpretation of the law and suggest that this constructive interpretation of the law must necessarily implicate moral judgments when it comes to decisions about what the law is and what the law isn't. So, again, when I say that a positivist can um, develop a theory of law which which does uh, give rise to considerations of morality, this is not suggesting that uh, legal positivism, or at least these theories of legal positivisms, can be reduced to natural law, because what natural law does is place morality front and centre, and suggests that it is morality, or the, the moral law, from which all legal principles derive out of. A legal positivist doesn't believe that, but a legal positivist doesn't necessarily mean that you have to uh, disregard and have no interconnection between law and morality whatsoever, because you could have law and morality having some kind of relationship with each other and still be a legal positivist. And that's really what Dworkin and as does Hart also um, suggest when they develop their theories of law.